I would like to take a minute and recognize Norma Geller, and where did Dan go? We had to get some water. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan, we went to get some water. Oh, there he goes, Dan is Norma's son. Um, Mrs. Gallup, Norma was a 1987 summa cum laude sociology graduate at John Carroll. Uh, she started, if I got this wrong, please correct me. At the age of 45, she came back to school and started at John Carroll. And I won't mention the department you started in, but eventually you ended up in sociology, and we were very thrilled to have you here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, in appreciation of the education she received, Norma and her husband Albert presented a philanthropic gift to the department to be used for programs related to the betterment of human relationships and the enhancement of human dignity. This lecture series is a result of that endowment. In addition to sponsoring the Geller Lecture Series, Mrs. Geller is involved in many other charitable and philanthropic activities, both here in Cleveland and her winter home in Florida. Among these is JCU's Lobber Project, which as many of you know, helped feed the homeless. Um, at times, she brought her son and her grandchild uh, to Lobber with her. And in one of the visits, they looked at her grandson and said, my goodness, young man, how old are you? And he said, I'm 13. And they said, my goodness gracious, you are the youngest person we've ever had at Lobber. And I won't mention Norma's age, but then they turned to Norma said, and how old are you, Mrs. Geller? And she told them she was a little bit older than 65. And they said to her, my goodness gracious, you are the oldest person we've ever had, Barbara. <laughs> so it gives you some sense of the family and the commitment that is extended through multiple generations. Uh, in recognition of the gifts that uh, to John Carroll from uh, Norma and Al Albert, um, she is the 25 recipient of the university's alumni medal, which is the highest honor the university can bestow upon its graduates. She is also the 2017 recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Cleveland Jewish News Magazine. This award was given in honor of her many contributions to life here in Northeast Ohio and elsewhere. Um, we would be remiss tonight if we did not honor the spiritual presence of her husband, Al, late husband. Um, Norma and Al were married for 69 years. Uh, he was her best friend and her companion through life. Um, this is the second Geller lecture where Al has not been able to join us. Um, Al Geller lived by two mottos. You only live once, so make a difference. And I hope I get this pronounced correctly, to come along, which can be translated from the Hebrew Bible as repair the world. And that is the essence of Norma and Albert Geller. Because you only live once, make a difference, and prepare the world. Um, they have both given very generous of their time and resources to education, to spiritual development, to social justice activities, including soup kitchens and aiding those who are sick and ill. They have lived a purpose-filled life, a life filled with service to others, a life dedicated if you will, to the Jesuit theme of her personalis, the care of others. So, on behalf of the Sociology Department, Don Carroll, thank you for your Thank you, Dan, for sitting and enjoying this as well. I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Medora Bottoms. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Edward Kanda. Uh, Dr. Kanda is a professor emeritus at Kansas University. He also still has an active, ongoing relationship as part of the coordinator of the Spiritual Diversity Initiative at the School of Social Welfare there, which I can't wait to hear more about. Um, his work addresses some really interesting themes. He's going to be talking about some connections between cultural diversity, spirituality, resilience, transformational growth, and the philosophy of social welfare in relationship to health, mental health, disabilities, and social justice. Um, he has more than 200 publications. Let me just pause there. He has more than 200 publications, um, has conducted 240 presentations. He has a number of books. Some of his most widely cited books include Spiritual Diversity in Social Work Practice and Contemporary Human Behavior Theory. 
2013, he received the Council on Social Work Education Significant Lifetime Achievement Award for Innovation on Spirituality Through Scholarship and Education. Um, so we very much look forward to hearing everything that Dr. Kanda has to share with us tonight um, concerning both spirituality within social work and a variety of other things. So thank you very, very much for being with us tonight. Um, we look forward to it. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. I appreciate this invitation and I appreciate all the uh, wonderful hospitality of you and your colleagues, Dr. Barnes. So uh, the presentation I'm going to do, or well, maybe I could have help to get this thing. Um, it's really kind of a, a very concise overview of key life lessons that have emerged out of my work during my career. So I'm not going into the technicalities of research and and practice, but I wanted to present major themes that I feel can, are relevant to everyone in our journeys through life. Uh, and so it uh, really goes through my work ranging from the 1980s until now. And it encompasses many uh, aspects of practice within social work. And it also involves integrating my background in comparative religious studies. Uh, that has been extremely helpful in my work around spiritual diversity in social work. So, let's see. so my plan is to provide an overview of key insights about resilience through my career. And this is largely inspired by what in social work we call the strengths perspective. The University of Kansas, where I've been on uh, faculty for more than 30 years, uh, they first coined the expression strengths perspective in 1989, and so it really focuses on ways of uh, understanding people's capacities for growth and transformation, even when they're dealing with significant life challenges and problems, but never reducing people to deficits or to uh, diagnoses, always viewing people holistically and honoring their full potential. <clears throat> so this is going to range through areas of work with refugee resettlement, uh, chronic illness, mental health recovery, and mindfulness. And then I'll wrap up with a few concluding insights. Many of us are familiar with the legend of the phoenix, <clears throat> the uh, magical bird that becomes consumed in flame and rises again out of the ashes. I think that's a really helpful metaphor for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, today, I'm going to be really addressing some very significant life and death issues that everybody faces in one way or another. <clears throat> and as I do that, uh, actually this is a very hopeful message about the potential for growth and transformation, but some of the issues are, are difficult involving uh, human suffering and serious challenges. So please pay attention to your feelings as I go through the presentation and take care of yourself uh, as needed. But my message in brief is this. Uh, life is a limited condition and a limitless opportunity. So we should all make the most of the opportunity. My purpose in doing this is to promote awareness and appreciation of a, a growth-oriented way of life where people can move from coping to transforming and thriving. <clears throat> For example, contemporary research in the human services, uh, one area this is coming to the forefront is post-traumatic growth. So social workers and other helping professionals and educators, uh, I hope they're, you're being encouraged to be open and supportive of people's full developmental possibilities, support people's optimal potential in whatever situation according to their own priorities, and promote conditions of well-being and social environmental justice that are crucial for this growth. I want to start with a couple of cautions or caveats, though. I'm not meaning to hold up some kind of comic book superhero standard. I'm also not meaning to imply we should push clients or anyone to live in the way I'm going to talk about, but rather uh, to highlight this as an opportunity, as a possibility for how we can address uh, life challenges and when people choose that way of life that we support them in it. 
It's also not blaming individuals for obstacles and oppressions that they may experience. It is supporting people in all their circumstances, even when they're down and out and when they're ready to move up and through. Uh, I grew up in the Cleveland area, so it's really nice to be back here and also to have some of my family here. And a shout out to my uh, niece, Professor Angela Kanda, <laughs> who's here, I believe. So, ah, great. Uh, so, you know, I think in many ways, um, some example and lessons that I got from my Bohemian immigrant uh, ancestry has shaped my interest in resilience and transformation. Uh, this is a picture of my uh, grandmother, Barbara Pukova, and she lived in a, a small village in Bohemia for more than, her and her family lived there for 200 years, pretty, pretty stable. Immigrated alone in 1903 at about the age of 14 under very difficult circumstances. Uh, she married Frantisek Chanda uh, in Cleveland and raised a family in a Czech Catholic parish. So there are certain themes there about a ma that's a major life disruption. Even though it was by choice, it was a, everything was completely uprooted and she had to recreate her life here. And actually the Czech Catholic parish that she was in provided a strong community-based support system. And I've seen those kind of themes repeated in many respects for many people. Uh, I also at this point want to respectfully acknowledge this land the indigenous peoples here, past and present, and all beings, uh, this earth and beyond. So now I'd like to explain what I mean by spiritually sensitive and culturally appropriate practice. I really like the metaphor of the lotus. This is very commonly used in Hindu and Buddhist traditions. The lotus grows in, in muddy and murky water, so it grows up out of the mud and the murk, which is like this, the struggles and suffering that uh, humans experience in our uh, living conditions. So it involves authentic encounter with mortality, suffering, and injustice. But growing out of that, the, uh, the plant rises up, the leaves spread out to the light on top of the water, and beautiful blossoms open. This is like realizing wisdom in daily living and also realizing the difference between pain and suffering, which I think I can get to later. The budding flower uh, represents the resilience and growth and beauty that can come out of courageously uh, confronting the human condition. But this isn't just a matter of somebody's choice. I decide this is, I'm gonna make my life this way. This requires nurturance. So just like a lotus, it requires nurturance of the water, the nutrients of the water, which includes uh, that very murk, uh, and the uh, openness and support by the earth and the sky and the, the light from the sun. So we all need to be providing this kind of nurturing context and support for each other. And social work as a profession is a support for this process from small system levels to, uh, to national, international, uh, global. I wanted to briefly say what I mean by spirituality for the purpose of this presentation. I'm not presenting from a theological standpoint, I'm presenting from the standpoint of professional social work. Uh, so in social work in related professions, it's become common to uh, distinguish spirituality and religion as related uh, but distinct concepts. So for me, spirituality is a process of human life and development that focuses on some central themes like meaning, purpose, morality, and well-being in relationship with oneself, other people, other beings, the universe, and ultimate reality, however people understand that. It also orients us around centrally significant priorities that guide and shape our life. And it can engage a sense of transcendence meaning uh, experiences that can be deeply profound, sacred, or transpersonal. Spirituality can have private and public components, religious and non-religious expressions, and healthy and unhealthy manifestations. So from this standpoint, uh, religion is an expression of spirituality. 
Not everybody obviously is religious, but from this standpoint, <clears throat> spirituality is an aspect of uh, all people and cultures. It doesn't mean they use that term. Like in social work, we're careful not to impose any terminology on anyone. But it, I think for our purpose today, the key is to think about these themes that I'm associating with the concept of spirituality. So spiritually sensitive social work uh, supports practitioners and clients in their communities as we're seeking this sense of meaning, purpose, and connectedness, highest aspirations, maximizing strengths and overcoming obstacles, and uh, actualizing well-being and justice, especially as these intersect with religion and spirituality. So I'd like to give you an example. Throughout most of the 1980s, most of my uh, research and social service related to Southeast Asian refugee resettlement. Uh, I worked as a practitioner, community educator, advocate, and researcher uh, on this topic in Ohio, Iowa, and Kansas. This is a situation, uh, all, all refugee resettlement work uh, is involving the intersection of various, various aspects of spiritual and cultural diversity. They're, in the case of Southeast Asian refugees, it involved interactions with people from cultures imbued with Buddhism, animism and shamanism, Confucianism. The, it involved interactions of international, national, state, and local organizations and individuals, many with secular and Christian affiliations. So this kind of interaction is very complex and sometimes contentious. Sometimes it goes smoothly, but sometimes it doesn't. So one of my roles was try to help these interactions become collaborative and mutually supportive for the benefit of refugees. <clears throat> the uh, refugees I work with had experienced significant trauma uh, coming from uh, homelands, experiencing genocide and mass murder, warfare, extreme of disruption. And sometimes my clients uh, in, initially uh, in the mid 80s, uh, they were uh, youth who were resettled as unaccompanied minors, so they had no adult caretakers. Uh, they would talk about when they were escaping the extremely difficult circumstances of fleeing through, for example, Vietnam, uh, getting on some s small boats where there were more humans than fit on the boat. So people had to take turns in the water. Uh, many people did not survive, and then long periods of uncertain. Uh, delays and, and difficulties living in uh, host uh, refugee camps, finally settling here, and then going through a period of dramatic cross-cultural and linguistic transition, um, and fortunately also sometimes complicated by experiences of racism and discrimination. <clears throat> I remember one of the Buddhist temples that was uh, where I was doing some of my work. Uh, there was a time when some people uh, came by and shot it up uh, with guns. Some others were painted with uh, swastikas. And more pervasively than that was human service professionals who had a very ethnocentric attitude and they thought the only way to provide health and healing services was their way, a Euro-American centered model and often this created conflict and cut people off from the strengths and resources of their traditional healing systems. Uh, so, for example, uh, a wonderful thing is that many Christian congregations provided uh, host families and support through the congregations, um, but sometimes this created ambivalence for uh, the refugee families because they generally came from uh, Buddhist uh, and or shamanic backgrounds. And so sometimes um, Lao and, and uh, Khmer and Vietnamese uh, clients would tell me, you know, we still go to the Buddhist temple, but please don't tell our sponsors. <laughs> uh, now, on the other hand, as a, you'll see an example later, many times the sponsors had a more embracing, inclusive, collaborative approach, and that made all the difference. Um, okay. So in order to promote optimal responses to support the amazing resilience of refugee communities, I think some key ingredients Genuine respect, appreciation, and interest, not like a token interest, uh, something superficial, or, uh, but really dedicating your life, helping professionals need to fully engage 
which means we ourselves transform in the process of that engagement. And working on the basis of partnership, collaboration, and synergy. For example, I would arrange mutual cross-training and referral between uh, conventional Euro-American Euro medical and, and helping systems and traditional helpers and healers like monks, uh, shamans, uh, acupuncturists. Um, and then also we need to support the development of culturally based mutual support systems such as temples, mutual assistance uh, associations. Uh, I would like to tell you a little more detailed story to make more clear how this can go well, but also sometimes the challenge of it. <clears throat> so at this time, uh, I was in the University of, uh, of Iowa on the faculty and working with the Bureau of Refugee Programs from the state. Uh, one time a Methodist minister called me. He heard about my work with the state. So he said, uh, I have got a situation. I wonder if you could help me. He said that there's, uh, there's two uh, young men uh, who are from Laos who were roommates, and they were having a dispute and arguments, and there was some uh, threat that one of them might hurt the other one with a knife. And he's saying, what do I do? Can, can you come and help out somehow? I thought, oh, well, that, all right, how am I going to do that? And by the way, I, I don't speak Lao, so I worked with a, a bicultural uh, interpreter and uh, uh, mediator. So we went and met the, the pastor uh, in the apartment of the two men. And um, we got in a conversation about what was going on, and actually it started to get preheated. Their, their discomfort, their, their disagreements was uh, accelerating, and I was feeling my own uh, uh, sensations of tension, awareness, becoming hyper-alert. And then I, I noticed... Oh, man, I made a Ricky mistake this time. I was sitting in the far side of the room. The exit door was on the other side. And I'm thinking, where's the knife? <laughs> so, you know, social workers know that we have to be careful about home visits and where we situate and how we do things. But that was also alerting me. My anxiety sign was also a signal of what was going on in the group dynamic. And my interpreter was getting stressed out, mediating all of this. So it occurred to me, I need to recenter, I need to refocus, and the whole thing needs to, to shift. So the roommates, when we first came in, they offered us all a glass of water as a sign of hospitality, and we were running low. So I said, would you mind if we just had a, a glass of uh, water uh, refilled again? And they said, oh, great, great, we'll do that. So it shifted now. They were in the role of uh, hospitality with with guests, and it broke the momentum that was going on. So I was able to resituate, to center, to become mindful again. Uh, everybody reoriented. And then we were able to get into more constructive dialogue. So to make a long story short, what it turned out was there was not really a big issue between the roommates, but they both had been under so much stress. They were just like uh, um, triggering off of each other. And so one of the roommates said, what I really need to do is I need to take some time to rest and reflect and get out of this situation. What I'd like to go is, do is to go to the Lao Buddhist temple, spend some time with the monks uh, resting and meditating. And uh, the pastor said, uh, all right, that's a good idea. I, I can help arrange that. So he said that they were fully welcome in, in his community, in his congregation, but that also meant respecting their culture and their religious practices. And so he saw that as complementary, not oppositional. And so he and uh, <coughs> a refugee uh, providing uh, agency and myself, we worked out a plan for him to do that. And that actually uh, resolved the whole situation. So this shows a couple of elements that I think are key to spiritually sensitive social practice uh, or any kind of helping, that we need to facilitate collaboration with spiritually attuned supports and where we can find congruence, collaboration, complementarity, and cooperation across differences. But also when we're in the situation, we have to stay clear-minded. And if we get distracted, we have to be careful we don't just get pulled off into like a conflict dynamic, or internally become so preoccupied with the jabber inside that we're not really attuned to uh, what people are wanting to communicate. And then we need to do this in a way to achieve practical goals set out by the clients. 
This also involves extensive multicultural teamwork, which would take too much time for me to, uh, to explain. Another area of my work has been around chronic illness and uh, disability. I was on the board of directors of a, uh, a local office for, in the independent living movement for several years. Uh, so I got uh, interested in this in particular out of personal experience. Uh, I have cystic fibrosis, which is a, a genetically uh, based uh, chronic health condition. So uh, about 40,000 people in the U.S. have CF. When I was born, the average lifespan uh, of survival was about five. Uh, I was not diagnosed at the time. Um, until recently, it was about 37 years. Now it's projected for people who are born now about 56. So the rate of treatment, I mean, there have been some amazing breakthroughs uh, recently, actually. And in fact, I'm doing much better than I was even 10 years ago because of some new medical treatment breakthroughs. But um, uh, growing up and living with a chronic illness, it means you can't maintain the illusion of immortality or invulnerability. Uh, sometimes people say, well, when we get to be older adults, we start thinking more about mortality and the meaning of life and what we want to leave behind. Uh, yeah, that may be true, but for me it was like since uh, childhood. So I think this has actually been a, uh, a benefit in a way for me to really uh, attune my life in a, a spiritually focused way. <coughs> uh, I like this uh, art piece here. This is a very large uh, sculpture uh, on a wall that another person with CF made. He's a pastor as well as a person with CF uh, who has had a lung transplant. Uh, he makes these uh, uh, like models of, these are like the alveoli and the lung passages and they're full of sequins. You can't tell in the picture so much, but it's very bright and uh, brilliant. And he likes to use art as a medium for creative shaping and expressing uh, of his life and help other people to, to think about how to do that. Uh, in the 90s, I had a friend, um, we got connected through my research on CF and spirituality, uh, named Lisa, and she said in one of her essays, uh, what's become healing for me is to realize that our bodies are not objects but ongoing stories. The flesh is the timeline of the soul, its companion, not its competitor. What can make owning or finding our story difficult is when CF is perceived only as a tragedy rather than an opportunity or a process of discovery. Uh, unfortunately, she died in 2001 uh, waiting for a lung transplant. But up until the end, she maintained this very creative, uh, affirming attitude. <clears throat> uh, my older brother, Tom, also had CF. He died in 1991. Uh, in an essay, he wrote, uh, sometimes I think the Lord for CF. There are times when the positive thought comes to mind. What if I were born Tom? Excuse me. <coughs> Still gets me. But actually, uh, really uh, doing work in an area that has very deep personal significance, I think, uh, uh, adds depth uh, to, to professional work, as well as our personal growth. So he said, what if I were born Tom, but without CF? I believe the answer would be that I'd be a nearly total loss because CF has made me angry enough to demand some tough answers. Uh, in 92, together with some physician colleagues, and actually one of whom was my personal physician, a CF specialist, we published an article. It's probably one of the earliest medical studies looking at uh, uh, non-prescribed, spiritually-based treatments people were doing. 
And uh, interviewing 402 patients at a major CF treatment center uh, here over at Case Western Reserve, actually. Uh, about 66% uh, of patients used at least one type of non-medical therapy, and most of those related to spiritual beliefs and practices. And most uh, self-reported benefits, such as relief of symptoms, sense of comfort, and enhancement of well-being. So later in, <clears throat> in the 2000s, <clears throat> I followed up uh, to interview 16 of these participants in detail about their life stories and what did this really mean to them in a uh, more deep way. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, they all reported that CF had very negative impacts physically, mentally, and socially. But when we talked about the spiritual domain of life, they said that uh, they had mainly positive impacts, <clears throat> that it enhanced their sense of insight into the meaning of life, helped them draw closer to God or deepen spiritual practices. Many believed God used them to help inspire others and use the challenges to stimulate their personal and spiritual growth. <clears throat> Some said that prayer reduced physical symptoms and discomfort. Um, and all of the activities of wide range promoted a positive outlook and helped to reduce confused thinking and painful feelings. Uh, many said they felt the relationship with a higher power and religious group participation uh, were particularly helpful. Some even reported what you might call miraculous or extraordinary events, like uh, sudden physical improvements, sensing the presence of God and angels, especially during difficult times and dreams, visions, and apparitions that gave them a sense of meaning uh, and, and uh, encouragement. <clears throat> uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to do some of these things uh, more briefly. Uh, one of the participants, this is a pseudonym, Joan, she said she and her husband, while they were waiting for her to have a, a lung transplant, said we really could feel supernatural strength up through the transplant. There is no real fear there. If I died on the table, I said, that's okay. This came after a powerful dream she had in which uh, she and her husband were on a boat on a stormy lake. And uh, this was actually, the, the account of this is very similar to the New Testament story of Jesus and the disciples in the rocky boat. And after that feeling of the dream, very deeply having a kind of spiritual support, she had a sense of ongoing angelic presence, even through the uh, through the experience of the transplant and afterwards. So some of the, the key recommendations that the participants had was um, that we, as helpers, in this case in the medical context, we uh, identify and support the client's spirituality if it's relevant to them, however they understand it, and how it can play a role in support in dealing with chronic illness. And we support their process of seeking a sense of purpose and meaning in life. And we're fully present and respectful with the client as a whole person. And of very practically ensure that treatments are affordable and, and accessible, because often they're not. So I just want to give you a highlight from the area of mental health recovery. Uh, for many years, I worked with colleagues who are mental health specialists for people who are diagnosed with se severe and persistent uh, mental illness. And what was interesting was that it became clear when uh, researchers and practitioners talked with uh, mental health service consumers, they frequently said that spirituality was one of the most important components in uh, their uh, coping and also their, their growing through dealing with uh, ongoing uh, mental health challenges, but many mental health service providers ignored the topic, stayed away from the topic, weren't prepared how to address the topic, and sometimes they also were nervous because sometimes, uh, like severe forms of mental illness like schizophrenia can involve delusions and hallucinations with religious ideation, and so they didn't want to get crossed up between getting into this topic and then how are they going to deal with it intersecting with delusions and hallucinations. But the, generally speaking, the clients themselves aren't worried about that. It's the hang-up of the professionals. And so this, uh, myself and others in this team worked out ways to do um, a spiritual strengths assessment within the, a holistic, the context of holistic uh, mental health recovery 
work. Uh, just as an example, uh, I had uh, organized uh, uh, an event on spirituality and mental health recovery, and part of this was to put on a kind of art exhibit that uh, uh, mental health uh, clients contributed artworks to. Um, on the left, this shows two sides of his spiritual life. On the left was the sense of a kind of dominating, fearsome, frightening spiritual tone. He sometimes felt like God is a, as a giant staring eye, judging and criticizing. On the right was his sense of spirituality as a source of love, of verdance, of, of beauty and growth. And so he described his process of shifting from the fear-dominated side to the love-dominated side. <clears throat> the other one, uh, the person drew these praying hands. And if you look closely at the hands, weaving all around through the fingers uh, is like a rosary, or in the Buddhist tradition, a mala. And that's actually made of medicine pills. So she found a congruity, a fit, a complementarity between the medical treatments and her spiritual practices. I thought that was a really nice uh, symbol of that. Uh, so I won't go into this now, but if any of you are interested um, on my Spiritual Diversity and Social Work Initiative website, there are many free resources, including an assessment tool to how to engage in conversation about this with clients. So um, I've been very interested in mindfulness for a long time, even before I knew there was that word for it uh, in the last... Uh, 10 years, especially research and, and clinical practice around mindfulness is just uh, mushroomed. Um, mindfulness as it comes into the helping professions is nowadays commonly influenced by Buddhist traditions of meditation and mindfulness, but there are mindfulness type practices in all uh, traditions. Um, I'd like to convey a brief story which, of what was actually a very long and intense situation. Uh, of a friend who was the director of a diocesan uh, spiritual retreat center. <clears throat> she was a close friend. And uh, in her 60s, unexpectedly, she was diagnosed with a fast-growing cancer in her throat. And she died in about three weeks after the diagnosis. Uh, she lived her whole life with such presence of mind and such compassion and kindness um, and she brought that same stance to dealing with her dying process. I first heard that she had gotten the diagnosis. I think, Hija, you must have called me when uh, I happened to be in, in Germany at this uh, Santa Ana chapel uh, with some friends. And I was looking at these uh, paintings, which is a, a, a medieval theme of the dance with death that represents, during the times of wars and plagues, uh, there was a Catholic tradition of uh, picturing uh, death as a skeleton. And in each painting, there's 20 of them representing all the different aspects of society from, from peasant to king and pope. Everybody has to take their turn to dance with death. So it was really ironic <laughs> being there looking at the dances with death and then hearing this about my, my friends. And one of the things I think very moving about this, the last painting panel is by the artist, a painting of himself dancing with death. And there's a poem that says, now it's time for, for, for the artist, uh, Jakob Hebler, to dance with death. So our friend, actually, she danced well with life. So it prepared her to dance well uh, with death. Uh, her hospital room in a hospice uh, unit was set up with, they were, everybody was very supportive for her how to uh, create a, her own sacred space with important symbols and objects and music that fit her with, with meaning and purpose and nurturing and, and sense of the sacred. People would come and visit. I spent a lot of time with her, uh, not even really speaking, just sitting and meditating together. So that kind of mindful presence together with actually was very uh, powerful in that situation. So therapeutic mindfulness 
uh, draws out some characteristics of mindful meditation and applies it in a therapeutic uh, manner to help the practitioner, the, the professionals themselves to be centered and clear-minded and interacting in the helping process and also to help clients learn how to be non-judgmentally present of themselves in the moment, aware of their situation, including when it's involving distress and suffering, but how not to cling to it, how they don't have to be stuck in it. They can be, they, we can learn to be uh, compassionately and kindly and clearly aware of ourselves and our situation in the moment, but not trapped in it. So then we become liberated for how we respond. And we also drop out all of these extra layers of stress and distraction and confusion that we tend to habituate to. So this relates to a distinction between pain and suffering. Uh, I know we probably don't generally say we, uh, we want to be experiencing pain, but if we couldn't experience pain, that's deep trouble. There are some people who have a neurological problem where they can't sense pain, and if they, they accidentally touch something hot, they'll just burn. Pain is a signal. Pain isn't good or bad. Pain is a, is a signal that we have to pay attention to something uh, for, to help ourselves or other people, including emotional pain. But what happens is often we add so much to the pain. I don't want to experience this pain. This makes me infuriated. How dare this happen? Or what's going on with my life? How can it be like this? Why is it? How, how, or how should it, can it happen to my loved one? And we make up all of this you know, intense emotional um, uh, expansion around it, which is all very natural. But the problem is when we become stuck in it. So suffering is this stuckness to the pattern of pain in our unhelpful responsiveness. And mindfulness can help us get unstuck to it. And one of the interesting things is that scientific studies looking at how we, when people learn to be mindful with pain, the actual sensation of pain goes down. Uh, even without uh, uh, pain medications. Okay, so I'm going to move to concluding reflections. This is actually a pavilion at the retreat center that our friend was the director at. We like to sit there and watch the water. So I've tried to figure out what is a, what is a word that we can use to talk about uh, a way of life that is oriented towards this kind of growthful transformation that I talked about. I felt like resilience, that's commonly used, but it doesn't really cut it because resilience means literally springing back to a prior condition. So uh, as far as I know, I coined the term transilience uh, for this, meaning people who respond in a growth-oriented transformative way to illness, crises, trauma, disaster, and other life disruptions that can go beyond resilience and recovering, and, and of course needing surviving and coping, but it can move beyond that into transilience. Some people grow and even thrive through adversity and shift into a transformational creative way of living through all the ups, downs, and smooth times of life. So I see transilience uh, as a way of life. There's a major shift of worldview and behavior and lifestyle around that. So it's a developmental leap that involves the whole person and committing to a life path of well-being and well-becoming. It also breaks through conventional ideas about health and illness and fitness and goodness and disability. Um, it transforms daily life, its joys, doldrums, and challenges into a pathway uh, for growth. So that means life disruption can be an opportunity for life transformation. It's not a guarantee. I'm not saying you know that when people are in a state of crisis, it doesn't mean we simply tell them to get over it. N not at all. What this means is moving through it deeply and profoundly, but in such a way it's possible to connect with the growth opportunities of crisis. But this requires choice, perseverance, support, and resources. And sometimes this can become a life way of continuous growth in wisdom and fulfillment. Uh, and for me also, what the, I've seen people who uh, go through this in a very profound way, it opens us up to a sacred mystery that's beyond any human meaning making and stories about all this and takes us into some encounter with a, a kind of strength that transcends uh, the human uh, realm and gives you know, gives great meaning and 
and uh, power to it. Um, so some takeaway insights, uh, to be open to the profundity in daily life, approach life with humility, experience the mystery that's beyond human knowing names and forms, and make, uh, making a little uh, reference to the biblical story of Moses and the, the bush that was on fire but not consumed, inflames life with wisdom and infuses a sense of purpose. And then hopefully we apply any insight in vitality to helpful and liberating action and service to others. Uh, there's a little self-promoting pitch there if you want to <laughs> read more about this. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. So um, I know that some of the things he was able to talk in, you know, more in depth, and some things I know he has a lot more kind of insight and details to offer us too. So it is we have about ten minutes total for questions. So if there are any other things that people would like to hear a little bit more about. Yes. Yeah, so on the, on the topic of resilience, there's been a lot of research on that for right. years. And, um, you know, people vary naturally mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, personality or, or orientation. Um, how do you lead people to that um, perspective, that, that, that mindset? Or, you know, what it, in your work, what's most helpful in that regard? Um. Yeah, so how do we lead people to that? I think part, part of it is being uh, cautious about leading or not leading. Um, the most important thing first is to be in touch with where they're at. So, uh, for example, if somebody's in the midst of a crisis where they feel highly disoriented, uh, disrupted, maybe they're having a hard time even deciding how they're gonna, what they're going to do to survive that day, uh, of course, we don't say, oh, you know what, with, with the right attitude and support, you're going <laughs> to, yeah, that's the last thing you want to say. But uh, if we become sort of like a, a midwife through the process so that they go through the disruption and they, uh, at a minimum, they need to establish a safe uh, ongoing pattern of functioning, but you will often get uh, uh, clues that they are open to something more. Sometimes they're not even previously have thought much about it, but a dream will come to them that gives uh, an image of a possibility. I, I've heard that from clients sometimes. It was amazing. It was like they got this deep message from beyond their usual sense of who they were that there's something possible transformative through this. So one big problem is when mental health professionals might ignore that or not have a relationship of enough trust and respect to even hear the story, be told the story. So if you need to be open to it and you need to cue in various ways that you, you are uh, open and then when you, you see a, and hear or cue, you respond in such a way that shows you're humbly and genuinely interested, invite them to tell more of the story about it, what might it mean for them, and then it can naturally uh, unfold. Um, now, also, there are some people who are interested to say, you know, I would, do you have any suggestions? How might I uh, make the most out of this situation? I'm feeling like I can't even control my thoughts. I'm just preoccupied all the time. So if they're open to something like uh, a mindfulness practice is one example, then uh, they can learn some, uh, mindfulness uh, exercises or join mindfulness uh, groups. And then out of that, it also might open up an opportunity for more uh, possibility <clears throat> to emerge. And many times people feel, once they're familiar with mindfulness, there are rippling effects throughout their whole life that it can become uh, transformative. Um, and also many times people say that when they're really broken down, uh, uh, that disruption of their old life, it's actually... It becomes like a, a butterfly breaking out of the cocoon. 
And so there's a kind of natural growth potential and power there. And I think we need to be uh, attentive to it and, and nurture it. Another way is to help them make the most, if they are involved with religious traditions, how can they connect with the metaphors and rituals that can support that type of transformative uh, outlook? Uh -huh. I'm curious, you mentioned you know, pain doesn't necessarily mean you will have a transformative or engaging transilience. Right. But with, based on your experiences with clients and your research, does it, to get as high and be as transformed and positive as possible, is that only the case with the most pain? So oh, that's you interesting. Know, okay. You need pain to live, or they agree. But to really excel and succeed, do you need more pain to have that growth? I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, th in fact, that's a good caution that uh, not to imply that pain or severe pain or crisis is necessary. Or no, actually, um, there are, some people, in fact, are kind of... Um, highly precocious, even as children, they, they are oriented towards growth all their lives. And as to far as why, it depends on the person. And others, it can be through a blissful experience. You know, Abraham Maslow, the, the, the famous humanistic psychologist, he had a really interesting way of looking at it. He was looking at people who he considered uh, uh, highly self-actualizing. But self-actualizing didn't mean egoistically actualizing. It meant fully blossoming in your potential together with others. So he talked about the way in which somebody might experience a major life disruption or crisis, like I talked about. He called it a nadir experience or hitting low point. I call it a pit experience. So that's the life is going like this and boom. But some people have a peak experience, which he was also interested in. Your life is going like this and boom. Uh, you know, like um, some spiritual uh, breakthrough, a shift of consciousness. It, it could be something as uh, simple as a very profound experience in your family life. It could be you go out in nature. I love to hike in nature. Sometimes in nature spots, that there's it's a very transcending, moving experience. It could be through meditation or deep ritual or community events. So that kind of life disruption also, it can be uh, tremendously positive, even blissful, um, and that's another avenue to shift. However, that is still a disruption, and sometimes people become really confused and stressed, and they come back to their ordinary life. Now, what am I? I'm supposed to go to back to my old role in life and my old job after I've just had my mind totally expanded. I don't want to do that anymore. But then their family says, hey, this person's getting weird. <laughs> so you, you off, sometimes helping professionals also need to help people with the processing of peak experiences so that that can shift to an ongoing uh, positive way of life. So as a, a member of a religious tradition, much of what you say resonates with me a great deal. Also as a scholar of religion, uh, among the things I try to impress on my students all the time is that religion as a discourse is a product of the Christian West. Mm. Uh, and sometimes uh, <coughs> that discourse can sort of flatten and universalize certain kinds of things. Uh -huh. I was thinking about a way to ask this question, but I think Exodus 3 is a perfectly mm. good example. What might be presented as a quintessentially Christian reading of this uh -huh. story is one about universalistic freedom or mm. about uh, the, the opportunity to interact with the divine for everyone. But in its original context, as an ancient mm -hmm. Israelite story, it wasn't universal at all. Sure. It was about yeah. national liberation mm -hmm. for a particular people in a particular time and a particular national god and all kinds of things right. like this. Are there any kinds of controls for this model, which of course I believe in in many ways, but also sort of wonder, are there ways in which there's a kind of flattening of religious tradition that the spiritual traditions of the world are sort of being seen through a Christian lens, mm 
Mm -hmm. which might uh, change the way they are received. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, way, sure. Are, are there controls here? Uh, well, there's cautions. <laughs> so, um, um, in, for example, in, in the, the, the field of comparative religions and in my own personal explorations across uh, many traditions, uh, particularly uh, Buddhism and Confucianism, uh, some people look for commonalities in the genuine desire to find common ground, way to communicate, to share insights, but it can become oversimplified and the seeking of universals can then actually water down or eliminate or distort the particulars. Others want to emphasize particularity. So they say you have to look at this particular belief or practice in this context, in this time, in this circumstance, and we can't generalize out of it. Uh, for Just for me, I think both extremes are not practically useful, particularly for social workers, because we need to relate with people across many different uh, cultural and spiritual backgrounds. So if we hold the two in a kind of creative tension, it's helpful. So we don't fall into superficial generalizations, but we also don't become so split apart and segmented that we we can't communicate and uh, for, for you know very concretely with clients um, we're, we should never assume we understand what something means for a client even if someone the client grew up in the same religious tradition as a social worker the actual meaning and nuance of the same symbol can be very different and for some people it can be positive for somebody else it's horrific because of whatever happened to them so um, when in my work with uh, social work education, you try to sensitize people to uh, certain uh, like common themes, but also uh, to be very attentive to the particulars of a, a particular client in this situation, and that they also get to experience of connecting uh, with um, uh, religious um, experiences and communities different from what they're familiar with. So we have exercises to help people do that. But those exercises also involve a very detailed re reflection and processing. Uh, you know, I've been involved with interreligious dialogue in various ways, and uh, it can go well or not so well. And sometimes uh, um, people just sort of, uh, you know, bleach out all the the important distinctions, and that's not ultimately the best way either. Um, so uh, the, the hard work of dialogue, and when I say dialogue, I don't just mean talking, but living and immersing. So I have, at least for myself, I've tried to do that by very deeply living and immersing, not only in the Catholic tradition, but I've been a, a, a longtime uh, Zen practitioner uh, and uh, also a, a longtime student of Confucianism. So I'm talking about decades long work, not going to a workshop, um, well, that's a start. <laughs> Um, and for me, by doing that in quite diverse worldviews, it's been fantastically uh, growth promoting. So it's not easy, but I highly recommend, <laughs> recommend it. Well, thank you very much. We are out of time. Those of you who still have questions, come on up and talk to him afterwards. We so appreciate you being here and sharing everything with you to us tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.